Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Deepan Shaw at Houston Methodist uh, DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center, and I'm very pleased to be here today with uh, Dr. Sunil Rao. Uh, Dr. Rao is professor of medicine at uh, Duke University Medical School, and he's the section chief of cardiology at the Durham uh, VA Hospital. Uh, Sunil just finished uh, doing a wonderful Grand Rounds presentation this morning, and uh, this is an opportunity for us to have a little further discussion with Sunil. So welcome, Sunil. Thanks for having Pleasure me. Pleasure to have you here. And uh, what I thought I'd do maybe is have you just give us a one or two minute uh, overview sure. of what the key points were from your Grand Rounds this morning. Absolutely. So uh, again, appreciate the invitation. It's been a wonderful visit so far. Thanks again for having me on this live Q&A. Um, you know, what I talked about this morning was sort of a decade of research that our group as well as other groups have done looking at the incidence and the associated outcomes related to in-hospital bleeding in patients with acute coronary syndrome and those undergoing PCI. And I think a large body of data has now shown that it's really the most common complication that patients experience after PCI and it is associated with an increased risk of morbidity, mortality, and costs. There are a variety of different mechanisms that we discussed uh, that may uh, describe this association with adverse outcomes, but ultimately, really, the, uh, the issue is how can we prevent these bleeding complications and improve outcomes? And where I focused a lot of, the, uh, of my talk this morning was really on transradial access, which reduces bleeding risk in patients undergoing PCI, and the randomized trials have shown that it reduces mortality in patients at highest risk, such as those with ST segment elevation MI, undergoing primary PCI. Great, and so I, you know, I thought maybe we could do a little bit of deep dive into yeah. the radial, uh, which I think you know some of the data you showed I think is is very impressive. Um, that really it's the way to go in the future. Uh, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what are the current barriers. First, where are we at today yeah. in the U.S. <clears throat> as far as the penetration of radio compared to the rest of the world? Yep and what the barriers are and what you think we can do to overcome those barriers. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think it's hard to get a sense for where the U.S. is right now. Uh, you know, the National Registry, which is NCDR, is the one that reports those data. So, um, you know, if you're a site and you get the older reports, you can get what the national benchmark is for radial approach. The format of the reporting has changed a little bit. The last set of data that I saw was from the first quarter of 2018, which showed about 40.7% of the PCIs in the United States were being done via radial access. Now, in the VA system, which is a separate healthcare system and has its own registry, uh, the, bench, the, 50, the VA system passed the 50% mark last year. So about 55% of the procedures being done in the VA system are being done via radial access, so more than half. It has dramatically grown since we first looked at the rates back in 2004 to 2007. Back then, it was only about 1%, so it has increased dramatically. What's responsible for the increase, um, you know, I wish I could say that it's all the data, right? I mean, we all want to be data-driven, but I think it's a variety of things. I think it's the fact that we have people who have trained to do radial and fellowship are now going into practice. I think there is a recognition that bleeding complications are important. I think there's a recognition on the part of health systems that uh, reducing bleeding risk can reduce uh, the length of stay, reduce costs. Um, and I think there's a coalition of the willing among interventional cardiologists who want to improve their practice and, and adopt these new techniques. Now, why isn't it higher uh, is a little bit more of a complicated question because I think there is some inertia on the part of uh, every interventional cardiologist to adopt new techniques and try to change their practice. And for those who have been trained solely in femoral approach, it's a very uncomfortable thing to go from being an, uh, a so-called expert in one thing and realize that you may be a novice at others. But I think those barriers are slowly starting to come down, and I think we are going to continue to see the rate of radial uh, access being adopted at an increased frequency over time. Mm -hmm. Now, what about geographic uh, variants? Yeah. Is there a lot of variants from the East Coast, West Coast, the, the South, the North? Absolutely. In fact, there are some papers that have documented this. Dimitri Feldman looked at this in his paper in circulation a few years ago. Um, you know, in the Northeast and in the Southeast, there tends to be fairly high adoption rates of radial access. In the Plain states and in the South, as well as the West Coast, it tends to be a little bit less so. Now, um, on the West Coast, the overall individual operator volumes tend to be a little bit lower. So that may drive some of this lack of adoption of radial access. If you're only doing a few cases per year, you may go several years without seeing a complication. And so that may be less of an incentive to change. Uh, again, it'd be interesting, I think, um, to look at this again, just to see if those trends have changed. What we are seeing, though, is that even in these sites, uh, in these states where there has been relatively low rates of radial access, there has been an increase over time. It's just the degree of increase has been a little bit less. Mm -hmm. Right. So let me move uh, back to the earlier part of your grand rounds, which was on bleeding complications. And yeah. 
you know, what is the uh, level of anemia that patients may be able to tolerate? And maybe I thought we could have you touch on that a little bit and maybe some work that's being done to try to help define yeah. that, that better. Absolutely. And so I think there's a lot of individual variability in what degree of anemia a patient will tolerate. It has probably to do with a lot of their comorbidities, this concept of physiological reserve, which is a little bit nebulous, um, you know, how severe their coronary disease or their heart failure may be. We know that in general, anemia is a bad thing. I mean, there are several studies now that have shown that the presence of anemia, and most of these studies use the WHO definition, which by most accounts is a relatively mild amount of anemia, um, are poorly tolerated and are associated with an increased risk of mortality. Having said that, how we correct that anemia has been very, very tricky. So the data on um, erythropoiesis agents has been summarily negative. We know that even in the high-risk populations like with CKD or even dialysis, totally correcting their anemia with uh, erythropoiesis agents increases the risk for myocardial infarction. So in the renal population, for example, we don't correct to normal. We correct, we don't correct to normal. Now in the cardiac population, we have very, very little data. There have been observational studies and two small pilot randomized studies of transfusion. Um, you know, basically showing that it's a feasible trial to do. Uh, Jeff Carson in New Jersey is leading the, uh, the now international NHLBI-funded MINT trial, which is randomizing patients with STEMI and non-STEMI and anemia, defined as a hemoglobin less than 10, to two different transfusion strategies, maintaining a hemoglobin of eight versus a hemoglobin of 10. Now, this is a little bit different from the critical care population where the trials have been seven versus nine. And the triggers of eight versus 10 really come out of observational data that suggests that the harm from transfusion, if there is one, is manifest at a hemoglobin above 10. Or, I'm sorry, above eight, above eight. So if you get transfused at a hemo and your hemoglobin is above eight, there's an associated association with worse outcomes. That's where that trigger comes from. So the MINT trial, I think, which is about 3,500 patients, uh, we're about 1,500 patients in or so. Uh, once that's completed, I think it's gonna give us a lot more information on what the appropriate transfusion triggers are in this ischemic heart disease population. Great. And when do you anticipate the results of the MID trial to come out? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, we hope that it's soon. Uh, I want to uh, just give a shout out to all the sites that are participating. It's a very difficult trial to enroll in, so we thank all the sites that are participating. Uh, we're hoping to have the results in the next couple of years. Great. Well, we look forward to that. Uh, so we've got a question here from, uh, that was somebody texted in. It says, uh, what are some rare complications with TRI yeah. and some tips to prevent and treat? So great, great question. So no procedure is without risk. So there are complications that are associated with transradial access. Uh, they tend to be of a lesser severity than they are with femoral approach. So there's obviously things like uh, bleeding complications that can occur, forearm hematomas, for example. Left unchecked, the forearm hematoma can progress to compartment syndrome. It's an exceedingly rare complication because most operators are keyed into that. If there's a forearm hematoma in the recovery area, almost all the operators will go look at it, make sure that it gets compressed. Uh, rated artery occlusion is another potential complication. Most of the time it's silent. Um, there have been case reports of really terrible hand ischemic complications. But interestingly, in those case reports, the vast majority have occurred in patients who have normal tests for collateral circulation, so the so-called Allen's or Barbeau tests. Mm -hmm. So that suggests that it may either be due to embolization from a thrombus that's in the radial artery or due to poor hemostatic techniques. So we know that the use of non-occlusive hemostasis, for example, that is applying enough pressure to the radial artery to prevent bleeding, but not so much that you choke off anti-grade flow, can preserve radial artery access. The rate of radial occlusion in most of the studies is between one and 10%. I think any site that's doing radial access really has to have a program that's keyed into radial artery preservation and preservation of radial patency. Great. Good. Well, so um, I think it was a very nice discussion about your Grand Rounds topic from this morning. I thought I'd also segue, since we have you here, as, as you're now the uh, editor-in-chief yeah. of CERC Cardiovascular Interventions, maybe if you can just give us a little bit about your uh, uh, time and your experience with that. Sure, yeah. So it's really been a, a privilege for me to be the editor-in-chief for one of the AHA journals, Circula Circulation Cardiovascular Interventions. It's a subspecialty journal of the circulation family of journals that's focused on uh, interventional cardiology. So all aspects of interventional cardiology, uh, from coronary peripheral structural, observational data, health policy, economics. Um, we have a terrific editorial team. 
uh, of associate editors and a great circulation staff that help to make sure that everything runs very smoothly. We're very, very interested in communicating with authors. So if people are curious about whether their paper may be a good fit for us, I encourage them to contact us. We provide very candid, confidential feedback to authors within 24 hours of their inquiries to see if their paper would be a good fit for us. Obviously, there are no guarantees. Uh, it has to go through the peer review process. Uh, one of the programs that we're really excited that we started about two years ago, or about a year and a half ago, is the assistant editor program. So we have five assistant editors. They're within five years of completing fellowship training. They are part of the editorial team. They're on our calls every week. They even handle papers on their own. Uh, and they learn a little bit more about the editorial process. And after their t they get feedback on their own peer reviews, and they work very closely with an associate editor to understand uh, not only how the peer review process works, but how the overall process of publishing works. We've been very excited about that. Uh, we hope to continue that in the future. These uh, five assistant editors have two-year terms. So uh, November of next year is when we'll be selling our next set of five uh, assistant editors. So anyone who's out there is interested, right. I, I encourage them to keep an eye out for that. So I think that's a great opportunity for uh, fellows that are finishing their training or, or uh, faculty that are in the early yeah. years of their training uh, as a way to get involved and to really learn how this whole peer review process works uh, from the inside. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think with that, I want to thank you for uh, making your visit here to Houston to uh, doing Grand Rounds here at Houston Methodist and also for doing the Fellows Lecture that you're going to be doing this evening or this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again, Sunil, as, as, uh, as I mentioned uh, in your Grand Rounds introduction. Uh, I know you from the time when we were both Fellows together and it's tremendous to see your career and how it's taken off and it's a real pleasure to have Thanks you Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right.